So we are in Genesis chapter 17. This is the New Revised Standard Version. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land where you are now an alien, all the land of Canaan, for a perpetual holding, and I will be their God. God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Throughout your generations, every male among you shall be circumcised when he is eight days old, including the slave born in your house and the one bought with your money from any foreigner who is not your offspring. Both the slave born in your house and the one bought with your money must be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Can a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Can Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live in your sight. God said, No, but your wife Sarah shall bear you a son, and you shall name him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I've heard you. I will bless him and make him fruitful and exceedingly numerous. He shall be the father of twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this season next year. And when he had finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. Then Abraham took his son Ishmael and all the slaves born in his house or bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very day, as God had said to him. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And his son Ishmael was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very day, Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised, and all the men of his house, slaves born in the house, and those bought with money from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. That's quite a story. Yeah. I don't like the visual, though. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit of that as we get to that part. But I really, so before we started recording, Minister Joe said, I think I'd rather be the one asking questions today. <laughs> so we'll see if you can hold up that end of the bargain, Minister Joe. But I, I will um, cede the hosting privileges to you if you'd like to be the interrogator today. But I'll have some questions too. Yeah, okay. But I'm going to be, I'm, I'm saying all that to say I'm not going to start that way. I'm still going to start with a question for both of us to consider, and then I'll hand things over to you. <laughs> I want to talk about this 99 years old. Mm. So Abraham has been in the land. We found out last week, Lucas and I covered this, that it had been 10 years from the time he had left Ur to the time in which he and Sarai decided that Abram should have his child through Hagar. So that was 10 years. And now from chapter 16 to chapter 17, the space between those chapters is now 13 more years. So Abraham is 99 now. In chapter 16, he was 86. And apparently when he was called to leave Ur, he was 76. 
We also find out in this story that Sarah is very near his age. She's 90 and he's 99. So they're nine years apart. So you can do the same math with Sarah. That is, I think, an important observation for lots of different reasons. But I want to put it on the floor for us to talk about some of the importance. I'll start with this. I've been saying and saying and saying that Genesis is a summarized history. And when you're reading it, it can feel like one event follows the other very naturally. We're very used to television. We're very used to novels. And when you read a novel or when you watch television, you can generally expect that the things you're seeing are either happening at the same time. Sometimes that happens where you see one scene and then it cuts to another scene and they're meant to be happening at the same time. Or they're happening one right after the other. But if you're ever going to be going way back in time, they'll give you some sort of words to say 15 years ago, 20 years ago, something like that. But unless you get that exposition, you just assume these things are just happening one after the other. And that can give you the impression when you're reading the Bible where you don't get a lot of those clues, those cues, you might think, boy, in the Bible, God was talking all the time, like one thing after another. Like mm -hmm. he was always talking, always intervening. There were always angels. There were always miracles. Like, why is it so dry? Why do we go through these gaps and periods of history where it seems like God isn't doing anything? Or why do evil people rise up and it seems like God is not judging or bringing anything? If you pay attention to these stories, what I've been saying about summarized history is abundantly clear in the text itself. Who would have thought that the whole span of Abraham's story from chapter 12 to chapter 15 or chapter 16 was 10 years. But then between chapter 16 and 17, there were 13 years. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean by an abbreviated history. There are a lot of gaps yeah. in this story. Abraham, the last conversation that's recorded of him having with God was 13 years ago. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know a bit about Abraham's life during those 13 years. But we don't know anything about it. And that's the way the Bible is. It's zooming in on the highlights, the scenes that are important for you to understand what God wants us to understand about these lives. So one thing I want to say is if it feels like there's a huge amount of gaps between when God speaks to you one time and when he speaks again, or when he makes a promise to you and when you see it fulfilled, or when you have an experience of God's presence and then you don't, if you feel like there's these large gaps, or maybe you feel like you haven't heard from God in forever. Join, welcome to the club. Like that's the normal experience of the people with God. It is the idea that we are regularly feeling like God is interacting with us consistently in real time all the time is not the experience of anybody in the scriptures, save one small group. And those are Jesus' disciples while he was with them in the flesh. So I want to encourage you if you feel like maybe God doesn't think you're important or whatever else because you're not having these intense interactions all the time. Neither did Abraham. I mean, as far as we know. So that's one thing I want to say about these gaps. But there's more to say about that too. I don't know anything jump out to you, Minister Joe, about Abram's age and the amount of time he's been in the land. Well, it's definitely... definitely uh a slower motion than we we could we could either tolerate or or imagine we we could not imagine the, the that short time. But there's other things that come up to my mind that 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 I, that uh, I think I think it, it's probably trying to to set a stage for something that we could probably talk a little bit more further on. But uh, I mean I think I think of of Jesus in the temple. I mean we, the the actual gospels the gospels talk about. Jesus being born and some of the events around his birth and uh, as much as, as, as much as being uh, settling in Nazareth, but those two, the, there's a space of time as well there before he's, he's actually presented. Well, it talks about going to the temple and being circumcised. But that, yeah. That's something that's developed here. But the, the whole aspect of, of him uh, at the temple when he was 12 years old, I think there's, there's maybe a correlation here that, that could be, could be paralleled to, um, but that's something maybe talk about a little further on. But I, I think that yeah, I agree with you. There are gaps in Jesus' life too, right? 
Yeah, I mean, we see him when he's getting presented and being circumcised. Mm -hmm. And then at his bar mitzvah at 12, we see him coming back to the temple. And then the scriptures are silent about him until he's near 30 years old. Right. Right. And I think, I think that's, you know, it, there's that temptation when you said you'd really like to know what, what, what uh, Abram or Abraham experienced in, in those 13 years. Um, I, I think, I think there's probably a lot of, a lot of books and a, and a lot of extra canonical books that have, that have tried to explore that yeah, as well. Yeah. Um, but, but the point is, is that it's not something that's necessarily something that we need to know right now. And I, uh, and that, that sounds like one of those kind of ignorance kind of things. Oh, you don't know, it's better not to know than anything else. But um, there, there are sometimes those things become distractions. Uh, and we have to be careful. Like there's a long history of people filling in those gaps with fictional um, texts. Mm -hmm. We might call them pseudepigraphical texts if they're written under false names, apocryphal texts if they're... Um, meant to be supplements to the text, but not trying to compete with its authority. Um, so we have to be careful when people are dancing in the gaps. And that's, I, I, you know, I preached on this just a few weeks ago and got into quite extensive conversation, even did a live discussion on the, th kind of the things we think are true about Satan, about his angels, about demons. Um, most of that speculation that, in the end kind of produced John Milton's Paradise Lost was all playing in the gaps, the things that were not told. It's like building an entire story about Abram's 13 years between Ishmael and the making of this covenant. Like, like because it doesn't say anything, nobody could accuse you of saying false things because nobody knows. Could have been this. I remember I read a book called The Robe, which I really liked by Lloyd C. Douglas which was a story about the Roman soldier that won Jesus robe casting lots. And right. it tells, it, it weaves this tale of how that robe and his experiences at the cross, and then being the soldier who had to investigate the rumors of the empty tomb. And, and then it ends up weaving it into a tale of the founding of the church in Rome. Mm -hmm. Now, everybody knows that the founding in the church of Rome is a bit of a mystery. We all know that the scriptures say that Jesus robe, they cast lots for his robe and somebody presumably won it. We all know that the, that the Jewish leaders were involved with some Romans in terms of trying to figure out what happened to Jesus' body. So those are all things explicitly said in the text, but Lloyd Douglas created this fictional tale yep. um, and nobody knows how the church in Rome was founded. We know that Paul writes to that church, but we don't know who founded it. And Rome has its own mythology of Peter founding it or Peter and Paul together founding it or whatever happened. Some say Priscilla and Aquila, nobody knows. So he wrote an entire fictional tale based on the gaps, yep. things that are not said. And the benefit of doing that, as I said, is nobody can question you right. because nobody knows it's unfalsifiable. But the problem with doing it is because the scriptures don't say, if you like the story, you'll begin to entertain the possibility that it did happen this way. And now you start to read the scriptures as though fictional tale you've heard is in fact true right you gotta be careful with that it happens with the left behind novels that are mostly speculative um and uh i'm not saying we shouldn't write books like this but i often wonder why christians consume themselves with writing fictional texts around the scriptures well, rather than simply studying what god has preserved for us in them yeah it's similar to the golden cap Right. Yeah, we'll talk more about that. Yeah, similar to the gold cap, or, or even the, the picture on my window back here. You can't see it too well of the, of the Last Supper, mm. where they're sitting, sitting around a table in a, a fancy room. It's, it's Da Vinci's idea of, uh, right. of what it is, and, and, and that, that's, our, that's our mind. I, so there's something within us who wants to fill in the blanks. I think it may be similar to, to the idea of, of what happens in our brains when we see something, uh, there's the scientists have, have said, and this may be a distraction as well, um, or a sidebar, a rabbit trail, maybe something to add out later. I don't know. Um, the, the whole, the whole concept that what you see 
it's filled in by the brain sometimes. Like you look straight ahead of you, you really don't see what's in front of you. The, the brain actually puts it, pieces it together. And so I think religiously we try to do that too. Where we're, we're trying to, to build a structure or build, build an image of what we see. It's like somebody thought the ark outside that we, that we, we mapped out. Um, somebody said to me today, they, they said, how in the world could that be the ark of the covenant? <laughs> And so, yeah. so that it would be a men would have a hard time carrying an ark that big. Yeah, we filter everything through, and and I want to be careful how I say this, but there is some wisdom. Well, there's a lot of wisdom in the commandment not to make graven images, mm-hmm. and the logic given to Israel was you should not make a graven image because they didn't see an image when God appeared to them. It was smoke and darkness. And you ask yourself, why did God wreathe himself in darkness? Why does he let no one see him? And you can get very theological, say, because nobody could see God and live, because that's what the story says. And that's true. I mean, nobody can. But there's some wisdom about a people who were prohibited from making pictures of the things they worshiped. Right. Now, we have violated that in the modern world. Christians carry crucifixes, there are crosses in every church. We've certainly made images. Now we tell ourselves that these are symbols, but that's all images ever were. God was absolutely in the Ten Commandments not allowing the Israelites to make symbols. But then you ask yourself, well then why in the temple? Did they have cherubim inscribed in the curtains? Did they have cherubim on the top of the Ark of the Covenant? They were, they were certainly required to make things. But every one of those things was specifically commanded to be made by God. Mm -hmm. And it imitates, is an imitation of his throne room. And he specifically tells them what to make. My way of reading it is he prohibits us from making images of anything except those things he commands us to make images of. And I think that's, it's a very interesting thing. And I would suggest that one of the, it's a deep type of wisdom that most of us, it's too deep and too wise for most of us to even understand it. But you just said it with the Da Vinci painting. Once you see a picture of it, that becomes your reality. Once you have a picture of Jesus that you've seen, that becomes Jesus to you. And I have a suspicion that the Ten Commandments were actually trying to prevent that kind of memory hijacking by the people in power. Mm -hmm. Because people, it's harder to control Jesus if you read his words, but it's easier to control him if you paint a picture of him and tell people who he is. Mm -hmm. Like now you've controlled the narrative. So I think there is something about that. And I think, we may find out in eternity, I suspect that we will, that writing fictional events about the gaps in scripture was a blasphemous thing to do. I think we will find that it violated the spirit of the Ten Commandments to do that. And I'm very concerned about it because I noticed that a great many people have been ruined in their capacity to read the scriptures by these fictional works. Yeah, it could be also that that there's this anticipation of when when you take away take away the the awe or or the anticipation of something being revealed, it's sort of like uh, for instance, you know, maybe this is too human of an analogy, but when when we, when we had children, they said, "Do you want to know if it's a boy or a girl?" Well, Tammy and I we did, we said we don't want to know until it's delivered, and there was a sense of anticipation that 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 gave her the drive to to want to birth birth the child no matter no matter what what what, what if they were a girl or a boy we wanted a, a baby and and so maybe that helps with a little bit of the the idea of an, an anticipation so in worship in, in the scripture when we read it there's there's a sense of of anticipation that God is going to speak yeah and 
and I, I brought up with Minister Claire today when I met with her, we, we've spoken. I said, I think it's so powerful that when we realize in the scripture, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's, yeah. There's a an anticipation. There's a there's actually, um, when you have a product in your hand that's so much different than, than actually hearing. Yeah, because I, I think if we wrote that today, most Christians would have written the words, faith comes by seeing. Right. And seeing by a multimedia presentation of the word of God. Like, right. I think that's how, but the scriptures actually through time were transmitted orally. Mm -hmm. They were spoken and they were heard and then they were written. That's an entirely different way of operating in the world than operating by sight. Mm -hmm. We live in a world where nothing is worth talking about if it cannot be presented in some way visually. Right. That's the Jerry Maguire syndrome, right? Yeah. Show me the money. Show me the money. I want to see it. Mm -hmm. And that's the way we treat the scriptures too. Like most people, their access to the scriptures is through a play based on them that has been put on television or in the movies or whatever else. And we talk about that as very powerful. I actually get recommendations from people all the time that I watch movie presentations of the life of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I irritate people because they ask me the next time, did you watch it? I'll say, no. Why not? I might get around to it. But the reason I don't watch it is that's not how the gospel was intended to be heard. It was intended to be heard and read. Once you see it, you wouldn't believe how many decisions are being made so that you see it in a very particular way. Right. And the visual can overwhelm the critical, the oral, the thought process. I mean, the visual is so stimulating. It's like saying, I'm going to eat sugar, vegetables, meat, and crack. And I'm going to keep eating the one that makes me feel the best. Mm. You, the reason you wouldn't put crack in there <laughs> is because it's too much. It's mm. going to overwhelm. You're going to forget everything else. It's going to become an addiction. And the visual is that way. The visual is hyper stimulating. When it comes to the weightier things, the spiritual things, our ancestors always knew to deal with words. Mm and not with images. In fact, they were prohibited by the law itself from making images. We, we live in an entirely different world, and I would argue that the reason we live in the world we do is because we have violated this deep part of wisdom, and we have made pictures of things that should never have been made pictures of, and we have made fiction of things the Bible speaks nothing about. Mm -hmm. And it has changed our entire orientation to the word of God. That would be my concern. And I know there's no turning back the clock. But remember, the Ten Commandments said, right along with don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, don't covet, don't make images. It's right there. Honor your father and your mother. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Don't make images. It's right it's, there. Sure sounds a lot, a lot like that motif that I was talking about before about the Ten, the, the Ten Commandments. Yeah. I love images. I love television. Mm. Um, I love stories. I love pictures. There's something unhelpful about that mm -hmm. when it comes to the Word of God. Yeah, yeah it becomes a rabbit trail. And, and it's but, too stimulating. It's too stimulating, and our children have been raised with it. I worry the only books that are popular now are books written like movies. You know, the most popular young, you read it, it ain't Shakespeare. And Shakespeare was, was actually pretty lowbrow because it was meant to be performed. It's no wonder nobody can access some of the deeper texts anymore. Everything is television. You know, everything's visual images and visual stimulation and music. And, you know, it's, it's all about the performance. So anyway, we got into all of that because we were talking about my comment. I wish I knew what Abraham did for those 13 years. That, that 
I think we've gone on a rabbit trail about rabbit trails. What's okay. important is what God has preserved. Right. Right. Yeah. I think that was worthwhile. I'm not going to cut it out. People can skip it if they don't like it. But I'm going to let you be the interrogator as we move through this, because you asked for that. And I'm, I'm happy to be the interrogated. Okay, so I guess the, the, first, the first question really would be, you know, Abram, God has already made a covenant with Abram. And why all, why all of a sudden at this time frame, we've already said 20, 22 years or 23 years or 13 years, if you really, however, however you want to, years, years have gone by. Yeah. Why, why, why now the sign and what does, what does, uh, what does this do for us in, in our faith walk? Is that the is, other question? It's a really difficult question, actually, because there's a lot of debate about it. Okay. Um, so God makes three covenants with Abram. He makes the first one, leave Ur, and I'll do these things for you. He makes the second one in chapter 15 right, where Abraham is credited his faith in God, is credited his righteousness. That's when we had the torch and the animal pieces and God walking through and promising his children. And now you have chapter 17, and you might ask, and this is very repetitive. I mean, it's the same promise. And each occasion, the same promise is given, but more is required of Abraham. I have tended to take this as um, a model of what it means to walk with God. Um, but this is very controversial what I'm going to say. So I'll be interested what you think. Mm -hmm. But I think the plainest reading is that when God first comes to us and asks us to follow him, it doesn't come with a whole lot of requirements. At the beginning, it's, it's a big move. Mm -hmm. For Abram, it was leaving his household, but it was a reasonable move because his family was already headed to Canaan. They just got hung up in Haran and God asked him to continue his journey and he'll be with him. So it's, it's, a, it's a hard decision, but maybe a natural decision. God makes a promise. Then in chapter 15, Abraham's now walked with him for a number of years. And God comes and reaffirms the promise at just the point I su suggested, and I really read the Abraham story this way, that maybe Abram's faith after 10 years was starting to lag. And so God reaffirms this covenant with him, almost like a covenant renewal ceremony, gives him further promises, but again, doesn't ask that much of him other than that he believe it. But now in chapter 17, he's going to reaffirm this 13 years later, still hasn't received the promise that was given to him when he left 23 years earlier, the land of Ur. But God is now going to reaffirm the promise because now he's on the cusp of actually getting it. Isaac is going to be born a year from now. So God reaffirms it. And now after 23 years, he asks Abraham to do something in response. Mm -hmm. He asks him to circumcise. And then in chapter 22, he's going to ask Abraham to sacrifice his son. I think this is the way discipleship goes. Early on, it's about faith. But eventually, faith is going to have to have feet. Mm -hmm. And I take this as a discipleship pattern. I see it in the New Testament with the apostles and Jesus' slow progress with them. And I think it's very similar to the process we go through. But I do think that what begins as requiring only faith eventually will require physical obedience in tangible ways. So that's, that's I, and covenant renewal is important. It, it's not just in Abraham's life. God will come and make a covenant with Isaac. He'll make one with Jacob on a couple of different occasions. He'll make one with Joseph. And then once the Israelites make the covenant of Sinai, they also go through renewal ceremonies. Mm -hmm. Joshua makes one with them before they enter the land of Canaan. And then many of the kings, the, the two that stand out to me are the covenant renewal ceremony under Hezekiah and the covenant renewal ceremony under Josiah and then the covenant renewal ceremony under Ezra and Nehemiah. These are recurrent things. Um, we need renewals of covenant because they reaffirm the relationship, and God often does this. So I actually preached on it a few weeks ago where I encouraged our people to renew their covenant with God. But that's coming out of this trajectory. It's the story. 
of covenant renewal, I think of Pentecost as a similar thing. This is like the second, the second half of the, or part of that, that Genesis 12 though, right? With the, the, the blessings of the, of the nations. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot, multiple, uh, is that what it's, isn't that exactly what it says? I, I will make you exceedingly numerous. Yeah. You know, and uh, I think Abram's response is pretty, uh, pretty great, fell on his face. <laughs> It's the typical response when God truly visits a person mm -hmm. is, is uh, f fear and humility. Yeah. And Abram, it also gives you an indication that maybe this hadn't happened in a while, you know, just cause he's surprised perhaps but God he changes his name. Yeah. So God officially changes his name. What now, you said before, if I recall correctly, that somebody you spoke to said that, that Abram isn't much different than Abraham. Can yeah, you... Abram means exalted father. Mm -hmm. And we're told that Abraham means father of many. It all depends on how you think the language is working. My mm -hmm. friend didn't think there was much distinction between the two. But I, I think Abraham looks the most to me like father of people father of nations, as opposed to exalted father. So I think that's what God's doing. Um, but it is tough. I mean, when Hebrew people name, um, like even Isaac, that name sounds like the verb for he laughs, but it's not exactly the verb for he laughs. So Abraham is supposed to sound like what it means. It's not an exact, like you can't break down the name and say, these are the words. So it's similar to, but it seems like God's intention is to tell Abraham he's not just an exalted father, Avram, but he is going to be the father of many nations, Avraham. That's more like a, what they call it, a homonym? You mean uh, two words that sound alike? Yeah. But, but more, it's, it's almost like a, 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 can I coin a phrase? <laughs> a homonymic synonym? <laughs> Meaning they're meant to, to mean the same thing and they sound very similar, but one word is invented and the other word exists. Oh, okay. So, so, you know, I won't give my daughter's name on YouTube, but we did the same thing with her name. Um, the Greek word is for peace is Irene. Mm -hmm. So we gave her a name that sounds like that, but is not exactly that. Mm -hmm. So we would say it comes from the Greek word for peace. Gotcha. But it is not exactly the Greek word for peace. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very biblical. That's typically what was done. So Abraham is meant to, the name is meant to indicate that God's promise to him has been more specifically revealed. And the same thing with Sarah. Best I can do, Sarai looks to me like it means princess from the words um, Sarar. Mm -hmm. Looks like princess. And Sarah best I can do, it sounds like the word for perseverance. So when you, when you think of this text, do you, is there any flashback to, or the, could you, could you say for a moment that this is a reinvention of, a, of the Adam and Eve thing? Actually, I'm going to go back to Adam and Eve when we get to the circumcision part. Okay. So I, my answer to that is yes. But what are you seeing here? Well, the, the changing of the names, the, the multitude of nations, uh, you know, it seems like, like that, the, the new source uh, of, of uh, you know, um, of faith. So, I mean, that, yeah, there's that, something interesting here, right? Because God names Adam, but Adam names Eve. Mm -hmm. But in this case, God does the naming. And I cannot think of another time in Genesis other than the creation of Adam in which God is the one who names the people. There is something very profound about God intervening and changing the names given to them by their parents or by their circumstances. You know, this culture could be different. You could earn your name. Um, so there is something very significant about that and very Genesis-like, very creative. God is interfering. And you'll notice Jesus does that, not with everybody, but he does it with Simon Peter. 
right? His given name was Simon. And Jesus gave him the nickname Peter. So that, that happens. It does not happen to Paul because both those names were given names. Saul was his Hebrew name. Paul was his Gentile name. But, but when God does this with Abraham, it's pretty significant. It's very rare that God renames a person in the Bible. We should stop and ask ourselves, why does he do it now? And what does this mean? Yeah, the only other person I think of is Jacob. But Jacob gets the name Israel. Mm-hmm. That's the only other, only other instance. But it's certainly not something that's common. No, it's not common at all. Yeah. 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 So it's important. And I, there is something Genesis-like about that because God generally leaves the naming of things to people. Mm-hmm. You notice in creation, he has Adam name the animals. And Adam goes on to name Eve. And Eve names the, the kids, Cain and Abel. You know, God doesn't get involved very much, but he does here. You're right with Jacob. He also gets involved in the name. He also gets involved in the naming of Jesus. Remember, he gives that name specifically to Joseph and to Mary through the angel Gabriel. So Jesus gets very specifically named. And, um, and of course, Jesus renames Peter. But they're rare. Names are very important in the Bible. They indicate a great deal about the person. When God intervenes to change a name, it indicates a transformation of that person. Right. That's the, but that's the reflection of the very sign yeah. of the covenant. So I think, I think that's why it's so important. It is very important. And Abraham, whatever he set out to become, this covenant with God will change his destiny mm-hmm. and therefore changes his name. Is there, is there any correlation here, you think, of the order of creation as, as a parallel as well here? We'll talk more because, about that. Because of the land being, being formed, is the land and this is being the forming of the nation, and then, and then the flesh. I think for me, as I hear it, I think the Garden of Eden is in view. Yeah. You know, like God created the whole earth. But then he prepared a very specific place for Adam and Eve to live. Mm-hmm. And I, I see that beneath this, that he's indicating to Abraham, I'm going to select out of all the earth, I'm going to select out a place mm-hmm. that I'm going to prepare for you to live in. Mm-hmm. And of course, he's already told him it's going to be a long time before that land's ready for him, right? 450 years before his children will really take this thing over. But I feel, I, I see a lot of Garden of Eden imagery. And I suppose the Garden of Eden is creation in a microcosm, you know, in a smaller environment. Mm-hmm. But there is very much in the Garden of Eden story, the awareness that there's more world outside of this garden. And the same is true here. He's not giving Abraham the whole earth. He's giving him a place on the earth. Yeah. And of course, as many comedians have noticed, this right. land he's giving Abraham doesn't look like a garden. Right. I remember listening to one comedian who said, as he was looking around the Holy Land as it exists today, he said, if God told me this was the land he was giving me, I'd ask for what plan B was. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, right, right. But I think there's an element here of Abram feeling that as well, to some degree. I mean, it's like, bows his head low, and and there there is that that element of, 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 uh, you know, laughter. Yeah. Yeah, he laughs about, you know, when God made the promise to him, it was 13 years ago that he promised him he would have a child of his own body. Mm -hmm. And he's gotten no younger. And now Ishmael is reaching the age of accountability in these days. Right. 13 years old. He's going to be a man. Mm -hmm. So the heir has already come into adulthood. Mm -hmm. Abraham sees himself as good as dead. How do you process? I mean, I don't want to be the interrogator. I promised you would be, but I think this is a really important thing. Yeah. In chapter 15, Abraham believed God Mm -hmm. and God credited it to him as righteousness when he said he would have a child of his own body. But now 13 years later, he's back where he was at year 10 of being in the land, wondering if this is really going to happen. Mm -hmm. So 13 years have not increased Abraham's faith in this regard. They seem to have eroded it. Mm. which makes perfect sense. But how do you deal with the righteousness? Question, he was righteous in chapter 15 because he believed what God said, and now in chapter 17, he doubts it. Mm. 
I mean, how do you wrestle around with that? I... Well, he's, he's definitely dealing with, with some different issues here, I think, in some degree. Where I mean, we're, before he's talking about land, and land, land in, in your offspring will be like dust. Here, here he's talking talking about being the being all the all the nations, being all the leaders, the influence of the world. Should should we say? Yeah. You know uh, that that is a that is different than being the dirt of the land. You know. The, it is though. In fifteen, in all fairness, he told. I mean, Abram complained and said, "I don't have an heir. Eliezer, my servant, is my heir. No one from my own body." And God said, no, it'll be from your body. Mm-hmm. And then in chapter 16, they tried to have this child who was Ishmael. Mm-hmm. And God, did God ever tell him? He did tell him that Ishmael was not going to be the heir, that he was going to have one. Mm-hmm. Now, 13 years later, he says, can it just be Ishmael? Right. So it, it was about a child, not just about the nation or the land. It was about having a child. Yeah. He seems to doubt it now. And, and I don't want to put you on the spot with that, but for me, time erodes confidence. Yeah. Like I'm sure Abraham, the, the wonderful thing is God saw Abraham's faith in chapter 15, 13 years earlier as righteous. But that doesn't mean that that faith persists in its same strength throughout Abraham's life. He gets to this point and he, you doubt too. I mean, it's a pretty intense experience. He saw the fire pot, the smoking stuff. He heard God, the deep darkness fell on him. He, he, he had more of, or less like a vision or a dream because he fell asleep. And, and he had this amazing experience and he, he believed it. And now 13 years later, seems to me he's wondering, maybe, maybe that was just some bad fish. How long do you fight off the... the- yeah, vultures, huh? Yeah. So, the, yeah, we talked about that a lot in that in that discussion. So, I, I think God comes and reiterates his, his covenant each time with Abram at low points mm. in terms of his faith. I think God comes and reaffirms what he promises when the faith is beginning to lag. And it's another good reason to renew our own covenant with God when our faith begins to lag. That's what I was saying. I once had a guy come to me and say, I want to reaffirm my vows with my wife. And I said, why do you want to reaffirm them? And the best answer was, we need to remind each other what we promised each other. That would have been a wonderful answer. Because we're at a point in our marriage where things are changing. It's wonderful to renew your vows at crisis moments. Cancer diagnosis, empty nest, retirement. Wonderful time because everything is changing and it's a wonderful time to remind each other of what you said. But for him, it was just, I think it would be fun. It would be meaningful. And I thought, well, I'll do it, but that's not the best reason. But then after we did it, I had some other people saying, I think it cheapens the marriage if, any, if you renew your vows. It makes it look like you were going to get divorced or that somebody did something wrong. And I said, no, 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 no. This is a covenant renewal ceremony. Very important, especially at critical life moments. Because what it means to be married before you have kids is different than what it means to be married while you're raising kids, which is different. But what it means to be married when the kids are grown, which is very different than what it means to be married in retirement. It's a wonderful time to remind each other of what you said. And I see God doing that. Like when Abraham is hitting these transitional moments and his faith is low, God comes and reaffirms the covenant. In some ways, he ramps it up. Abraham knows in chapter 17 what he's getting into way more than he did in 12. Yeah, because he's asking asking to uh, do this this sign. And I'm thinking of the 318 men that went with him to... Yeah, it's a lot of people are going to get circumcised. And up until now, God has not asked Abraham to do anything Mm -hmm. other than to believe him. But now he has to do something, and it's not easy to do. We circumcise in the West a huge percentage of boys. This is a very American thing to do um, before they leave the hospital. Mm -hmm. But it's a whole different thing if if an adult 
male has to be circumcised. I mean, that's a surgery and it comes with a lot of complications. And they're doing this in non-sterile environments in the ancient world, most likely with sharpened stones. And they're gonna circumcise all these people and Abraham's 99. You know, Ishmael's 13. So it's a pretty significant thing God's asking him to do is the point. Right. And Abram does it without, Abraham does it without question. And we want to talk about why this sign, mm -hmm. right? We want to talk about that. Yep. And, um, but I don't want to jump into the why this sign before we appreciate just how much God is asking of Abraham. Mm -hmm. It's a huge request. Yeah, very much so. Very much so at his age. And I, I can't help but think that, that this situation, as well as Isaac later on, that, that the sons wouldn't be a little different afterwards. Um, the psychological effects of trying to talk somebody in, into explaining what this is, how this is a sign. Yeah, you know that this is an entirely different world when Abraham says this is what we're going to do and everybody agrees to do it. Mm -hmm. That would never happen today, would it? No. Let's put the church, man. Let's put it. <laughs> Yeah. So it, it reminds us it's a different world. It also tells us how much loyalty Abraham had gained from his people uh, over these years, that they mm -hmm. would follow him into this, or maybe how much they came to want to be part of this relationship with God, which they had associated with Abraham. Mm -hmm. You know, the, we don't even know the motivations that might be, but what we do know is that they do it. Yes. We don't hear, do about, it. hear about anybody saying, we're going to the church down the street now. Or let's go to Egypt or let's go back to Sodom. Yeah. Yep, because they all could have left. This might have been too high a price. So why this particular sign? Now, I want some of the low-hanging kind of fruit, the things that people have talked about. Um, there's a lingering belief in, particularly in the West, but maybe most particularly in the United States, that God makes this requirement because it's good for Abraham, purely for hygienic reasons. That this is a cleaner way to raise men. I want to kind of put that aside. Um, whether that is true or not is cultural. So not every culture on earth circumcises their males. And there's no good evidence that it's healthier one way or the other, though in America, the health is, is highly promoted. Mm -hmm. But let's just say there were some nations that did this in Abraham's day and some that didn't. It was not universal that nobody did. And it was not universal that everybody did. So Abraham's not being asked to do something he had never heard of, nor is he being asked to do something that everybody did. Mm -hmm. It's in between. Why does God choose this sign? Now, you and I kind of bantered about this, and I told you that I had an idea about it that I didn't want to tell you till we were live because I didn't want you prepared for it. <laughs> so I will tell mine, and it's just a theory. Mm -hmm. But I think it's worth talking about. I mean, have you given a lot of thought to this sign and why circumcision becomes the sign of the old covenant? The co eventually, this will be the sign of the covenant of Sinai but it's given to Abraham way before that. Yeah. I mean, are you giving me a, a, an opportunity to talk? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I, I think it's similar to the, to the question of uh, later on when, when Isaac, Isaac needs a wife, uh, the servant comes to Abram and Abram puts his hand, has him put his hand underneath his thigh to, to make swear, swear that he would, that he would make a, a find a wife that's not a Canaanite uh, for Isaac. And so that's, that's way beyond further, further on in, in, in Genesis. But I think there's a similarity because there's a, there's a sense that, that there's, you know, that this area is a very sensitive area. It's also, also in, in a lot of ways, this is going to sound horrible, but the, a source of life, part of, part of what makes life, without being extremely graphic, yeah. um, but, but uh, um, vital for, for, uh, for life. And uh, 
when things don't work, life doesn't happen that way. Uh, maybe more easier in our culture now with, a, with IVF and all those kinds of things, but <clears throat> there's still there's still the need for for viable uh, man uh, man man woman relationship. Yeah, and it, it's important that you're bringing that up because, of course, this covenant is about Abraham having a child, mm -hmm. and what God is asking to be marked is an organ necessary for that. So that that you you can't say that they're they're not related. You know, they are related. And we had mentioned some cultures uh, circumcise females, which the scriptural, the Hebrew people never did. But that is designed as a type of oppression of women to prevent them from feeling pleasure so that they will not stray. That's not what this is presented as. It's not a way of diminishing a man's way of, of taking pleasure in, in family interactions like this um it's about something else mm -hmm. but it is very tied to procreation no question that god is putting his mark on the organ of procreation in a way that doesn't damage it you know it doesn't damage the whole thing fundamentally god would never do this to a woman she doesn't have the ability to have this done without horrible consequences but men can, and God did it. So it has something to do with that. Right, right. And, that, and also the, the, the idea that it's an extreme vulnerability uh, where, where, you know, the thing about uh, memberships or things or to be involved, to become part of a, you know, frat or something like that, they, they would do branding or they would do tattoos or right. or, or things like that as a sign uh, that you have some type of allegiance to, to that. Um, That's right. And gods of the ancient world would use tattoos oftentimes and, and some other ritual behaviors. So God absolutely says this is going to be the sign mm -hmm. that you are a holy people, that you are set apart to me. All the males in your household will be circumcised on the eighth day. But again, why this? That's the hard question, right? Right, because it's not like a tattoo that can be exposed easily or shown. Yeah. Uh, but it, again, there is that that is that essence of, of vulnerability. Um, and Paul talks about there there are so there there's these when he talks about the, bar, the different parts of the body, uh, some for for noble purposes and some for it. He's trying to re, trying to. Re, talk about the body of Christ there, but that might be some, maybe more of a distraction at this point. But the, the importance of, of knowing that, that this is, uh, I think, the, one of the most vulnerable uh, parts of, of, a, of a person's body, uh, of a man's body. Uh, and so, so there, you know, that, but it is also, also the source of, source of life. It's, and, of bringing life, so I think that's something that reflects who God is. Yeah, and, uh, and one thing, this is where I think it ties to creation, like you asked why this particular sign, I think everything that you've been talking about, that we've been talking about, are probably related to it. The procreation idea that he's gonna have a child and this needs to be done before he has a child, that it marks the most intimate um, place. It also, um, God, when he first created male and female, they were, it was one, being Adam and then God takes from his side and creates a woman. So he, he divides the one into two and then in marriage, they reunify and become one again. This is the organ through which that occurs. And so um, setting that process apart is probably also important, but there's another little detail in the story of the fall that I wonder if it's involved in this. You remember that Adam and Eve were naked before each other in the Garden of Eden and they felt no shame, right? After they break God's commandment and they eat from the tree of knowledge and God banishes them from the garden, it also says that he made garments of skin for them to wear, right? Meant to be protection. And the natural way of reading that, of course, is that they were animal skins 
even though there's no discussion of the sacrifice of an animal or the process of tanning or any of that, that's natural assumption. Many people have assumed that God sacrificed an animal, took their skins, and they made garments of skin. But the Hebrew just says he made garments of skin for them. And the, and the garments of skin were meant to be protections. They were meant to conceal them so that they could be safe in a world that was no longer safe. In the stripping off of the foreskin, this organ is now exposed. It loses its protection as though the garment of skin has been taken off. And I think that's an important metaphor for who Israel was going to be. They were going to be a people who had to trust God for their protection because the layers of protection would be taken away. They could not make treaties with other nations. They could not just do whatever they wanted in terms of growing their crops and making their clothes. They had to follow the law. And I think that this is a very symbolic act of removing a layer of protection from a very intimate uh, piece of human equipment, which symbolized Israel's vulnerability in following God. And it comes into the New Testament as an image of what has to happen to our hearts. In Colossians, it says that our heart has been circumcised. What does that mean? Well, I think it means that the things that we wrap around ourselves to protect ourselves are removed. And now we have to trust God to protect us because there will be no natural protections. So don't worry about tomorrow. Don't store up in barns. You know, all of Jesus' teachings are about living a very vulnerable and exposed life, just as circumcision exposes a very sensitive organ. So we have to live exposed. Everything we do in the world is to protect ourselves from harm. That's why we build houses, why we lock our doors, it's why we wear clothing, it's why we take vitamins, it's why we, we have police, it's why we have laws. It's all layer after layer after layer of protection. I think the sign of the covenant is you need to forsake your protection and trust God. And I think circumcision is a visceral example of that. Right. Yeah, the, the troubling thing is is the difficulty of of the the fact that all those who are with with Abram or Abraham at this point um, choose to be circumcised, and those who those who don't are cut off, and they'll be they can't be part of his household anymore. Right. But they, but those who are born into 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 that family after this don't seem to have any choice at all. No, and are circumcised on the eighth day. Right. And some would probably say that's just mercy right there, because later on, it's, yeah, it's, it's they're tough. ethnically become part of this covenant from the time they're eight days old. Now that's not to say that they can't choose to leave, mm -hmm. but even if they do, they'll always be marked by circumcision. And you can say that that's true even in the New Covenant, that when you raise a child in the faith, even if they choose to walk away from it, they never rid of that upbringing. It's like the reverse Cain. Mark. Yeah. What did you say? Yeah, I, you talk more about that. That well, makes Cain, sense to me in the way I'm hearing it. Well, the Cain, the Cain mark was a, was a, a, a protection because, because Cain killed his brother. Yeah. And, and uh, thought that his punishment was too strong, so there was a mark put on him so that nobody could kill him. But this, this becomes a mark of identification with God. That, that uh, you know, so that the idea of, 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 of the mark of God on, on his people as a, as a, but this is something that's enacted not necessarily by God, but by, by, the, by those who choose him or, or uh, want to be in covenant with him. So that, yeah. that's the difference there, isn't it? And, and yeah, because they're adults when this happens. And yes, I think it is the opposite of Cain's. Cain's mark was a mark that promised greater protection. Mm -hmm. And this is a mark that promises um, more exposure. It's, yeah. it's a mark that makes one more vulnerable. And yeah. if, you're, if you're a child and this happened to you, you won't understand that. 
because over time, the skin of that organ becomes a little thicker and, and because it's, it's never been hidden. But if you've ever dealt with an adult who gets circumcised, you realize that the skin is so vulnerable without that foreskin. And so if, if we understand what circumcision is, it's removing a layer of protection. That's what it's doing. Now, nowadays, we might say that that's good because with that protection also comes health risks. And some people argue that that's the case, but there's no doubt it is a layer of protection that's being removed. And I think that's precisely why it was the sign of the covenant. All right, so let me throw you a curveball. You ready for this one? I don't know. <laughs> I'll Noah, I might swing. I might let it go. We'll see. The Noah thing. Get it over the plate. No, no, and ham thing. What's what? What's the deal with that compared to this? Um, um, it's again a very similar situation. Um, in that God wants the most intimate space of our lives sanctified to Him. Right. And that did not happen with Noah. Remember, Noah, Noah's nakedness was shameful. Ham uncovered that shamefulness, and it created a breach in the family. The other thing we could be talking about, which maybe is more common to talk about, is the way in which God wants to make sure that in our most intimate behaviors, we are reminded constantly that we belong to God. That he wants that inner room sanctified. And this is one way to do that. He's marking his territory, so to speak. Right. Right. And, and that does relate with the Noah and Ham because, because that space was seen as problematic. Right. right. And it's always been problematic. And, you know, today the scriptures tell us in the new covenant that circumcision is no longer the sign. That's a sign of the covenant of Sinai and of Abraham, but not a sign of, of the covenant of Jesus. So it's no longer required for people of faith, but its principle is still there in the new covenant that in our most intimate of spaces, usually described as the heart in the new Testament, it still has to be circumcised. Mm -hmm. We still have to be vulnerable before the Lord though. Mm -hmm. That skin of protection has to be removed. We have to trust God and not nature for our protection. It's still there, but now it's, it's enfleshed a little bit differently. Okay, so so uh, so God doesn't just just talk to Abram, but He's talking about. I mean, He does, you know. So my sign, that verse verse thirteen. So much, so shall my my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. Um, yeah, it's straight out right there. Okay. Yeah. But then uh, He talks about a blessing for Sarah. Now she's Sarah, Sarah. Yeah, Sarah, which I think means perseverance. I think went from princess to perseverance. Of course, there's debate over that. So if anybody has read other things, it's certainly not the only options. But those are my best guesses. I did the research myself mm -hmm. um, earlier, and those are my best guesses. So, so it talks about a blessing for her. How, how vital is that right at this point? I mean, I mean, Abram, Abram seems to think, seemed to think in Egypt. He seemed to think it with Abimelech. That, that everything relied on him. Yeah. Um, is this, this elevates Sarah, I agree, if that's where you're headed. I think it elevates Sarah um, and her, the essentialness of her part in the story. Already Abraham and Sarah have demonstrated that they didn't think she was very significant. That's the whole choice of Hagar and the birth of Ishmael. Um, she was not treated as essential to the promise that God's making. But here in this covenant, God insists to Abraham that Sarah is essential, mm -hmm. that the promise he's making to him is also to her. I think it's a very important observation because um, in this culture, that might not have been expected. I think the Abraham story shows us that it was not Abraham's first instinct to think that God's promise to him was a promise to Sarah. But God in insists that it is that the same promise of kings coming from Abram, Abraham is also a promise for Sarah. And that raises her as a co-heir of this promise, which clearly to this point, they didn't really think was necessary. So she's more than just a, a, a bearer of a child. Yeah. 
She is truly part of this covenant. Mm -hmm. It's made also with her. So she gets her own covenant here. Mm -hmm. He he says it to Abraham. That's the culture. But this is for Sarah. Now, Sarah doesn't find out about this for a while, it seems. It's in chapter 18, when she overhears the idea that she'll have a, a child, she laughs. Makes it sound like Abraham didn't tell her about this. Right. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Okay. He says that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, then he, qu- he questions again, you know, can, can, a, can a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Can, can Sarah, this is verse, verse 17, yeah. can Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? Yeah. You know, Lucas raised this question last, last week, and I sort of tabled it mm-hmm. because it, it's more appropriate to have that conversation in this context. Mm-hmm. But Abraham laughs here, and he's not chastised. But in the next chapter, when Sarah laughs... She is chastised. And her laughter is given in 18 as the reason for naming him Isaac, even though he's named Isaac here when Abraham laughs. Mm -hmm. So it it is an interesting discussion. I still think I want to kick that one down the road to the next passage, because I think it's more interesting once we see what happens with Sarah to make the comparisons. But Abraham's laughter and Sarah is perfectly reasonable. Like, this seems very unlikely. What's most interesting to me, though, is why Abraham appeals for Ishmael to be the heir when he already found out in 15 that that was not going to be the case, in 16 that that was not going to be the case. Yeah, it sure, sure seems like he's trying to contend for it. Still, still Boy, a lot's battle. changed in 13 years. Yeah. He's, he's really, he loves Ishmael, right? That's clear enough. He wants That's, Ishmael to be his heir. 13 years he's lived with this boy. He wants him to be his heir. So he appeals to God to change his mind. It's got to be to change his mind, right? He knows what God already said in 15. But we, talk, we talked about the sight. You can see, you can see the boy. Yeah. You know. I think Abraham is saying to God, would you reconsider? Mm-hmm. I don't think he's forgotten the promise. I think he's saying, we don't need that promise, Lord. Like, we don't need you to do this miracle and make 99 and a 90-year-old have children. We've got Ishmael. All right. Let's do but, it. But Sarah doesn't have Ishmael, and this covenant is with her too. That's the new detail. Because it's true. If it's just about Abraham, why not Ishmael? Or or he could have just said, "Hey, let's you know, I got Hagar here, and let's let's make this happen. Yeah. Let's make the make the Egyptians part of part of." The but I think he's asking God to reconsider what he had said in fifteen. I don't think he's doubting it. Mm-hmm. I think he's asking him to reconsider, mm-hmm. and God refuses. He he won't he won't do it. He says, "Oh, I, I'll take care of Ishmael, but no, Sarah is going to have a child." I don't care how old she is. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how tired you are. I don't care how hard it was to raise Ishmael. I don't care how far you've come with Ishmael. She's going to have a child. The answer to Abraham's request is no. I once argued with a guy. You, you and I both know him. I won't say who he is. But he used to say, he said it a lot. God always answers our prayers. And I said, you mean sometimes he says no? And he said, no, no. Sometimes he says, wait, but he always answers our prayers if we pray in faith. This is a good example of that being wrong. Sometimes he says no. Well, it also also exposes, too, uh, the the blessing that God gives to to Ishmael, or gives some details about it. Yeah, more details. He's going to have 12 sons. That's crazy, right? Because that number is significant. Abraham's not going to have 12 sons. Isaac's not going to have 12 sons, but Jacob does. So Ishmael gets, he also has 12 tribes, right? So there is something about, I don't know, God seems to like orderliness, repetition. Seems to like that. Yeah. But here, another detail, he told him he was going to have children 23 years ago. 
13 years ago, he told him he's going to have a son. Now he tells him next year. By this season next year, you'll have a son. So now the promise is close. Yeah. And Abraham's response is not to argue with God. He doesn't appeal a second time about Ishmael. He accepts God's claim and then immediately goes out and has everybody circumcised. I mean, Abraham is, the faith of 15 is showing itself here too. It doesn't, doesn't fool around. No. Better get no. that one right. Better get that one right, sir. Better get that one right. <laughs> yeah. And this, and, and I want to say this, and then you can respond if you have something on these lines that are interesting to you. But the reason in the New Testament, circumcision is an issue more so than kosher. You know, there are two issues in the New Testament about what Christians should follow from the law of Moses. Kosher comes up, right? You see that in Galatians, you see it in, in Acts chapter 15, and circumcision comes up a lot. But circumcision is the sticker. And the reason it is, is because it is not exclusively part of the law of Moses. Like kosher is part of the law of Moses. So if you're going to say Jesus establishes a new covenant, okay, maybe under that argument, kosher might go. But this circumcision is not just part of the law of Moses. This goes all the way back to Abraham. So shouldn't we be doing this as believers who are inheriting the faith of Abraham? This isn't a Sinai requirement. This is an Abraham requirement. So you can see why it's a bigger issue in the New Testament circumcision is. Because it's not simply a covenant of Sinai thing. It goes further than that. And you might say, by what logic can we discard circumcision? You read this thing. God said every generation, forever, or they'll be cut off. Have you given a lot of thought of that? To that, Minister Joe, as to how Paul logics away from circumcision. I mean, it's easier. The law of Moses stuff is easier than this one. Yeah, I think I think what, what we talked about before about the circumcision of the, of the heart, uh, the out the outward sign of the of the inward grace is the modern the modern word that we talk about for a sacrament. But the the, the physical, um, I think I think there was there was such a such an objective emphasis on on exterior faith that that uh i think that's why paul makes that argument so strongly about about it um the the confidence of of, of that is as well as as like you said earlier about in our culture today it's it, people would hardly even know if there was any any difference but you could probably uh, probably say that about our faith as well sometimes with people who have who uh there's no external difference difference between their, uh, yeah. the, an atheist faith and somebody who's, who's walking with, or yeah. going to church. So, um, so to, dis to dismiss it in the sense that, you know, probably some people would would, would, would try to wiggle out of that and say that that, that to be a, a follower of Abraham today is, is to believe what what Jesus said. You would do what what Abraham did, and, and I'm not sure that. It, just this circumcision was actually <laughs> what he was talking about. I think he was talking. Yeah, about. I agree with you. I think circumcision is a shadow. I don't think the circumcision of Abraham is out in the New Testament. I just think its its fullness had come. What this was meant to point us to was the complete vulnerability and trust in God we would need mm -hmm. to navigate our way through the world, and that is what is meant by circumcision of the heart. So I would say still the children of Abraham have to be circumcised. Mm -hmm. But the circumcision has now moved deeper into the person. I mean, this was, you know, people can wear, you can wear a chain around your neck or put a tattoo on your shoulder a lot easier than getting circumcised. Circumcised is more intimate. It's mm -hmm. deeper. But now that it requires the heart, that's deeper still. But the, the metaphor remains. It's about being vulnerable. It's about removing the, the natural protections that exist and moving into a space where you have to trust God to protect you. And I think that's the circumcision of the heart. 
and what we should mean by faith. Yeah, and probably some some people could argue that the visuals that we, we tend to put up for ourselves are some of those things yep. that that encapsulate the the vulnerability, the sensitivity to us to, to, to the Holy One or to, to God Himself. Yeah, we put we're always putting uh, masks on, protections up. You know, we can do that with God too. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember a message I heard quite a number of years ago. I think a pastor's name was Chick Shaver, and I think he used this message a lot. So I heard it twice from him, and I only heard him preach four times. So I think he, he preached it a lot. But he often said that holiness was about giving God the keys to every room of your heart, not just the rooms you were comfortable with. And so he would say that all of us keep some skeletons in some closets, keep some rooms of our heart closed off from God, closed off from others, these little recesses that are our private spaces. And that becoming a truly holy person meant that there is no privacy between you and God, that he has access to all the rooms. I think that is very much what circumcision is meant to show. It exposes what is hidden and it reduces the protection from what is hidden. Mm-hmm. I think that's what Chick was preaching about. Mm-hmm. That that the people who truly follow God have to have to allow him to expose and and follow him into a place where we have less protection than we had from nature before we followed him. Yeah, I think at Korah's tent where you hid the hid the stuff. That's, the, the, the stolen stuff. Aiken. Uh, Aiken's time. Did I say Cora? Yeah. 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 Uh, I meant, I meant Cora's the, Cora's the priest. Yeah. Priest, right? Sorry. Yeah, Aiken's time. And uh, often, he, hides, he hides the booty from AI, uh, from Jericho underneath it. Right. Yeah, and and that, that all, the whole vulnerability, sensitivity to God uh, aspect, I think, are essential to, to being being aligned with Abram and Abraham. And yeah, so what is a foreskin when it comes to national politics? Treaties. Treaties are a type of foreskin protection. You know, this is how Israel fell into a lot of idolatry, by making treaties with other nations. They were protecting themselves. They were building a layer of protection around themselves. And so treaties can be uh, that type of protection Uh, For Solomon, he married foreign wives, meaning that he made treaties by marriage with other foreign governments. You know, these are all, you could say, foreskins. I know it's a a little graphic for us because we don't like to talk about these things in our culture, but but that's what it means. And, and, And Moses will use this language when God says, I want you to go to Pharaoh and I want you to tell him to let my people go. Moses says, you can't send me Our English translations say, I'm a man of unclean lips. But what the Hebrew actually says is, I'm a man of foreskinned lips. What is that? People who are just taking it as a very um, visceral kind of description would say that he stuttered or stammered Mm. or had difficulty articulating himself. But uh, it's good to translate it unclean because foreskin has carried a different kind of meaning among the people of Israel from Abraham's time. Um, What Moses may mean, he could mean a number of things. He could mean that he, he's unworthy. His, he doesn't have a tamed tongue. Hmm. Maybe he's crass. Maybe he feels he speaks unholy. He just doesn't feel worthy to speak the word of God. Isaiah says the same thing. I'm a man of unclean lips. And then God touches him with a coal to purify his lips. So it probably has something to do with uncleanness more than it does with difficulty speaking. Mm-hmm. He, may, he may say he's being unworthy. But he all, also might be saying that my, my speech is too Gentile. I don't know your ways. I don't know who you are. I might have a circumcised body, but I don't have a circumcised mouth. How can I go and represent you to Pharaoh? Mm. And 
you know, God is more or less saying to him, I'm sending you. But for Moses, he's not worthy somehow. So God chooses Aaron, which is really a slap in the face because Aaron's his brother. He cannot possibly be any more worthy than Moses. So it's insulting to Moses, but God's kind of dismissing his complaint that any human could be worthy. But if God circumcises you, you're circumcised. And if God sets you apart, you're set apart. So I think um, there's a lot of play going on there that it took Abraham had to be vulnerable to follow God. He needed to be circumcised. And Moses identifies, I'm not circumcised. I don't want to be vulnerable. I, that's too risky, I think is what he's saying. Yeah, especially in front of Pharaoh. Yeah. Yeah. And so, funny enough, if, we, if you think, boy, you guys are making a lot of this. Maybe you have some issues. It's all over the Bible. When Moses finally goes, you remember the story? An angel of the Lord chases him down and tries to kill him. Right. Why? Because he hadn't circumcised his son. These themes. So his wife circumcises his son, takes the foreskin and throws it at the feet of the angel, and that spares no Moses' life. Don't tell me this is an uh, important image. <laughs> it's important. Moses claimed himself to have uncircumcised lips, and then he refused to circumcise his son, both of which almost ended his life. It's a very important metaphor, and it's still there in the New Testament in the circumcision of the heart. And I want to say this. There's a gospel going around out there that says you don't have to have a circumcised heart. You don't have to obey God. You just have to believe. That's true in chapter 12 and 15, but not in 17. You might get away with that for a little while, but not forever. I don't care your theology. If your theology teaches you the scripture's wrong, you should discard that theology. Doctrines of demons tell us the Bible's wrong in what it says. And the Bible says you must have a circumcised heart. At some point, like Moses, like Abraham, you're going to have to cut off your pound of flesh to follow Jesus. And don't fool yourself into thinking you don't. Any final questions or words, Minister Joe, as we've found a way to the end of chapter 17? So in our day, they were just as much followers of Abraham as, as we are of Jesus, right? I mean, well, I would say we're followers of Jesus, but we're, we're part of the family of Abraham by faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah, God's covenant on earth is with Abraham. It's with no one else. In order to follow God, we have to be grafted into the olive tree of Israel. We have to become part of the family of Abraham. And that's what Paul says, that that happens by faith in Jesus Christ, that God will graft us in. But there are no other chosen families. You and I cannot come to God as a, a Swede or German. That's your ancestry, right? Um, or whatever we are. We must be grafted in to the olive tree of Israel, and that happens by faith. And we become part of the family of Abraham because it's with Abraham God made his covenant. And it's a corporate covenant with Abraham. And we only become part of it if we become part of his family. And that happens by faith in Jesus. So those who, those who, uh, those who say, I just follow Jesus today. It's true we follow Jesus, but we must follow him in the faith of Abraham. Mm -hmm. and there's, there's that continuity is what I'm trying to get at I'm trying to yeah I wouldn't want to say I follow Abraham you can see that I'm backing up from that Yeah. because it's we don't follow Abraham we follow Jesus but in following Jesus we are walking with Abraham mm -hmm. and you must walk with Abraham like Jesus is the word made flesh so this word that has come to Abraham for all intents and purposes is indistinguishable from Jesus and Abraham is following Jesus just as we will. It's an irony that Jesus is also in his physical self a descendant of Abraham. <laughs> right. But it's Ab Abraham. This is why Jesus says in John, Abraham saw my day and he rejoiced. And before Abraham, I, I, I am. Yeah.
So I would never want to say we follow anyone but Jesus, but we, but Abraham is still an example for us of the kind of faith we must put in Jesus. Yeah. I just question our culture. Our culture today wants wants to discard a lot of the new, a lot of the old Testament. Oh yeah. Yeah. And that's what I want to try to get at. Yeah. And you and I have talked about this before and I know the church is tired of me saying it, but any faith, any description of God that does not deem the testimony of Israel as essential to who he is, is a false gospel. And that's an idol. The God who became flesh in Jesus is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he is the God who carried along the prophets of Israel as they recorded history in the way that God wanted it recorded. And any attempt to dismiss, to to excise their testimony from who God is and his revelation to us in Jesus is a form of idolatry. So I'm very much against that, but there are a great many Christians who do it on purpose, but way more who do it by accident. By not preaching the Old Testament, by trying to apologize for the the testimony of the Israelites in various texts and places. There are even entire books written to teach you to dismiss it and to embrace Jesus as almost a God without context. Uh, You know, as though God came down for the very first time in Jesus and you can forget everything else. Yeah. It's a Marvel comic superhero mentality with no context. Yeah. You don't need any, any context. You just need Jesus. Mm Mm-hmm. It's very contemporary, very American, very TV oriented. You know, you start watching your favorite TV show, the first episode, these people will just drop out of the sky. You might get their backstory in bits and pieces, but it's irrelevant to what's happening. Some people treat Jesus the same way. But he he had a context. Yeah. We must be children of Abraham. Yeah. But that happens by faith in Jesus. Mm-hmm. We, we're, we, we come into Abraham's family by sharing his faith. But thank you, Minister Joe. It's good to have you back. It's a good conversation. Thanks for journeying with us through Genesis.